LeBron James is a player who's garnered quite the collection of iconic moments in his career. Four rings, the all-time leading scorer, four MVPs, and the greatest hairline comeback of all time. LeBron has gone to war against countless incredible teams over the years, sometimes losing to them, but many times coming out on top. So who were the franchises that were the most demoralized by LeBron and tore it all down as a consequence of their failure against him? On the other hand, which teams beaten by him managed to bounce back and go on to greater things? Today we'll be revisiting the most notable victims to LeBron James and analyzing what happened to them following their defeat. Has LeBron's postseason career been underrated? Totally underrated. LeBron James is eviscerating the Raptors right now. LeBron James is their kryptonite. I mean, that, that's what it is. Underdog. Well, right. Me? I, I don't think so, but no, no, me either. <laughs> I, don't, I would never be an underdog. While LeBron's first tenure with the Cleveland Cavaliers from 2003 to 2010 is often remembered for its lack of a championship, there were plenty of postseason moments that showcased his legendary potential. The first example of this came in his playoff debut in 2006 against the Washington Wizards. In the closeout game 6 with the Cavs up 3-2, Gilbert Arenas, the star guard for the Wizards, was at the line for two free throws in crunch time with his team up 1. LeBron walked over to him, tapped him, and said, You miss this? You know who's gonna end the game. This was a reference to Arena's beef with Cavs player Damon Jones. Arena's had been taunting Jones the entire series about the money he owed him from their many gambling sessions at LeBron's condo. So when he when he whispers, you know who's gonna hit it, everybody assumed it was him. I knew what he was talking about. And I think the thought went into my head. Uh, they really gonna put Damon Jones in and let and, him hit a shot. And I just, <laughs> I just missed. Sure enough, Marina's missed a pair at the line, and Jones hit the game winner to send the Cavs to round two. LBJ called it. On top of this fire trash talk, James also had a monster series scoring 36 points per game. This wasn't the only time Braun would destroy the Wizards. In fact, it happened three years in a row. 2006 was the first. While similar defeats occurred in 2007 and 2008, LeBron took all the pleasure in making the Wizards and their all-star guard Gilbert Arenas a doormat for him to step on in three straight round one series. This consistent humiliation forced the Wizards to tear it all down and enter a rebuild. When one thinks of the Detroit Pistons in the 2000s, they think of a historically great defense and multiple championship runs that resulted in a ring. What many forget is that LeBron put a huge dent in the team's final few years of dominance. While it's true that the 2007 Detroit Pistons were already on the decline due to their loss of Ben Wallace in free agency, it was clear that they were still a team capable of winning it all. This was further proven in the 2007 Eastern Conference Finals against the Cavs, where Detroit was in primetime position to take a 3-2 lead at home in Game 5. In the first four games, LeBron had some nice moments, but in Game 5, he went from great to transcendent, cooking up one of the best performances in playoff history. On the road, he scored 48, including 25 straight points from the fourth quarter all the way to the second overtime. He hit the game winner on top of this, a superhuman showing against a phenomenal defensive team. This was when the Michael Jordan comparison started being validated. The Cavs ended up winning the series in six, knocking off the Pistons. It was a huge blow to Detroit, as they were looking to make their third finals appearance in four years. But Braun stopped them dead in their tracks. As a finishing touch, he swept the Pistons again two years later when they were completely washed. Detroit's decline as a contender had less to do with LeBron, and more to do with an aging roster and slow loss of pieces each offseason. However, it can't be denied just how dejecting that 2007 series was to their championship hopes. All this occurred when James was 22, and it was just the beginning of his reign of terror. The 2010s would come to be the time where he would establish his dominance. During this decade, there was one group in particular that LeBron took a liking to beating down on. That team was none other than the Boston Celtics, a hated rival that tormented LeBron more than any other in the early part of his career. In James's first calf stint, the Celtics successfully destroyed his title hopes in 2008 and 2010. If there was any one team that was circled on Bron's calendar for the remainder of time, it was the Boston Celtics. And boy, did he take things personally with them. 
After losing to the Celtics twice in his first seven years, he would go on to face them five more times in the postseason, and shockingly, he won all five. The first of these battles came in 2011, where LeBron's newly established Big 3 in Miami beat the Celtics Big 3 in 5. This series was a symbolic moment for LeBron's career. He finally broke the chains, dismantling the Pierce Garnett Allen trio that had haunted him for years. Most remembered from this series was how it ended. In Game 5, LeBron single-handedly went on a 10-0 run for the Heat embarrassing the Celtics with clutch threes and fast-break dunks. He taunted them after each field goal, sending a message to the city of Boston that the days of him not having enough help were gone. But while this 2011 semifinal series may have been the most impactful at a glance, the 2012 Eastern Conference final series between these two teams would triumph all. In 2011, the Celtics never really stood a chance, but in 2012, they were more motivated than ever, and came just one win shy of their third finals appearance in five years. The Celtics jumped out to a 3-2 lead, stealing Game 5 in Miami thanks to a Paul Pierce game winner over LeBron. The stakes were now at their highest, and if Braun and company got eliminated, all hell would break loose. It would have been a disgrace for James to fall short of a ring once again, especially considering he had infamously choked to the Dallas Mavericks just one year prior in 2011. On top of this, an L here would have ensured the splitting of the Heat's Big 3. It was make it or break it for the King, but he responded in the greatest way possible. LeBron defenders and apologists were starting to doubt if he was made of the right stuff. And they went over on that night to watch what was about to transpire. The Heat won that game by 19 points because LeBron dominated from start to finish with 45 and 15. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, 45 right. and 15 rebounds? Yeah. That was, in most people's eyes, the greatest game he ever played facing the most pressure he'd ever faced. Well, LeBron scored an incredible 45 points in Game 6, and the timing of this couldn't have been any better. This amazing show set things up for a Game 7 in Miami that the Heat won handily. This 2012 series against Boston featured perhaps the highest level of pressure any superstar had faced in basketball. For LeBron to respond in the way he did only cemented his greatness further. As for the Celtics, this elimination was the nail in the coffin for their Big 3. By this point, Garnett, Pierce, and Allen were starting to run out of gas. They were aging vets, and 2012 was their last chance at a ring. Ray Allen must have liked what he saw, because he joined the Heat in that year's offseason. As for Garnett and Pierce, they went on one last run with the squad that ended in a round one loss. Boston desired to rebuild, so the two stars were traded in the summer of 2013 to Brooklyn, where they lost in the playoffs to... you guessed it. The King had claimed another victim. This may have been LeBron's last rodeo against the Big 3 Celtics, but it wouldn't be the last time he'd meet this franchise in the postseason. Going back to 2012, following the Heat's elimination of the Celtics in the conference finals, one more adversary stood in the way of LeBron's first ring. Meeting him in the 2012 finals from the Western Conference was one of the most talented trios the league had ever seen, the OKC Thunder. When the 2012 OKC Thunder are discussed today, it's usually in the context of how they squandered the big three of James Harden, Kevin Durant, and Russell Westbrook. Their failure to beat the King in the 2012 Finals has much to do with that splitting. On the surface, this series may look like a clean and relatively easy 4-1 victory for the Miami Heat. But in reality, three out of the four Thunder losses came by under six points thanks to the Heat's flawless crunch time execution. What many forget was that OKC was actually favored by most sports media outlets to beat the Heat, but Miami's Big 3 overwhelmed them with their experience. LeBron averaged 28 points, 10 rebounds, and 7 dimes in this series, outdueling KD and winning his first championship. The result of this series would change NBA history forever. Had the Thunder won this ring, James Harden would have remained on the team. The reason he was traded to begin with was because the Thunder refused to pay Harden a max contract. Since they lost in the finals and Harden played poorly, letting him go was more understandable. But had they won, there would have been zero excuse or justification not to pay up. LeBron winning this championship prevented a future OKC dynasty. The Thunder would never again make the finals under Kevin Durant. What looked like a surefire championship core was wasted. Why? because the Thunder's ownership was cheap. 
but also because they just couldn't beat LeBron in the Heat. Paul George has been on a handful of teams in his career, and has put together quite the resume of achievements. Though for many NBA fans, his time with the Indiana Pacers remains his most remembered for his incredible playoff runs. The rivalry he and the Pacers had with LeBron in the Heat was incredible. In 2012, these two teams faced off for the first time in the conference semis. Indiana jumped out to a 2-1 lead, and hosted Game 4 at home with all the momentum in the world. Instead, it was LeBron and Wade who exploded, combining for 70 points and dismantling the Pacers to tie the series at 2. Indiana quickly realized that the lights were too bright, dropping the next two games to lose the series. In Paul George's seven seasons with the Pacers, the team reached their highest level of success in 2013 and 2014. They advanced to the Eastern Conference Finals both times in this stretch, and came incredibly close to making an NBA Finals appearance. But each year they found themselves in the Conference Finals. The Miami Heat stood in their way and promptly defeated them. 2013 was the most competitive of the two. The Heat won in 7 thanks to James's 29 points per game average. The Pacers were an elite defensive team anchored by Roy Hibbert, who was actually a good player back then, but LeBron destroyed them. James's best moment easily came in Game 1, where he drove past George for the game-winning layup in overtime. It's an iconic moment, and it haunts the Pacers to this day. The Heat ultimately managed to scrape by in 7, blowing the Pacers out at home to seal their NBA Finals trip. One year later in 2014, they struggled far less, winning in 6, with 3 out of the 4 victories coming in double-digit fashion. Although the Paul George-led Pacers posed as a strong threat to the Heat on multiple occasions, they were never able to muster up the momentum to eliminate them. A Paul George-like injury and poor management led to growing dissatisfaction from PG who eventually requested a trade in 2017 following yet another playoff exit to LeBron. Even when George was traded for Victor Oladipo and DeMontis Sabonis shortly thereafter, the LeBron nightmare didn't end. He beat Indiana in Round 1 of the 2018 playoffs in 7, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. LeBron eliminated the Pacers a mind-boggling five times in the 2010s, preventing two finals appearances. Whether it was a young and upcoming team like OKC in Indiana, or a veteran experienced opponent like the Big 3 Boston Celtics, it didn't matter. LBJ triumphed all. In fact, the Thunder and the Pacers weren't the only two teams led by a rising superstar that James beat as a member of the Miami Heat. Paul George and Kevin Durant were exciting players, but when they played James in the playoffs, none of them had yet captured an award quite as prestigious as the MVP. That honor was given to none other than Derrick Rose, the youngest MVP in NBA history, who played LeBron at the peak of his powers in the 2011 Eastern Conference Finals. LeBron, who came second in first place votes, took this personally. Not only did the Heat win this series 4-1 against the top seed in the East, but LeBron made it a point of emphasis to lock Derrick Rose up. Rose shot 6.3% with James guarding him, including going 1-15 in games 4 and 5. LeBron James had D. Rose looking like an LA fitness hooper, but defense wasn't all he did. On offense, James scored 26 points per game, including a crunch time takeover in Game 5. The Heat went on a 19-4 run to eliminate the Bulls, featuring dozens of clutch shots by the King. He sent a message to the MVP voters on who he felt should have won the award silencing the trash-talking Bulls with a signature performance. This dominant series decimated Chicago's hopes of a date with the Mavericks in the finals, and would unfortunately go down as their only real chance at a title run under Derrick Rose. Injuries were the cause of this eventual failure, of course. But what can't be denied is how easy Miami made it look against the 62-win number one seed with an MVP. This was a phenomenal victory for James against the Bulls, but one could argue his win against them a few years later was equally as crucial. Fast forward to LeBron rejoining the Cavs in 2014. The villain of South Beach was no more. James was now determined to win a championship with his hometown team. The 2015 playoffs was Braun's first title run as a reunited Cavalier, and it was special. In round two, he squared off against the Bulls once more. But this time around, Chicago was far more threatening than 2011, jumping out to a 2-1 lead. In Game 3, Derrick Rose hit an incredible shot that won it, and this could have been a huge blow to the Cavs. But instead of bowing his head to defeat, LeBron responded with a game-winning shot of his own in Game 4. 
It's hard to put into words just how demoralizing this shot was for Chicago. They were on the brink of taking a 3-1 lead against the biggest obstacle that stood in the way of a conference championship. But with just one shot, their hopes and dreams crumbled. The Cavs won the next two games to take the series, and Chicago's front office went into a panic. They fired their coach Tom Thibodeau a few weeks after this exit, and in the following summer traded Derrick Rose and let Joakim Noah go. The cherry on top is their trade of Jimmy Butler two years later. It's not unreasonable to say that LeBron and the Cavs basically ended the Derrick Rose and Jimmy Butler era in Chicago. Had the Bulls won, there's no way their management would have been justified in trading Rose and Butler or firing Thibs. LeBron had beaten the Bulls in their infancy in 2010, their peak in 2011, and their decline in 2013 and 2015. His fingerprints are all over this franchise's implosion. The Chicago Bulls were victims of LeBron James. But not every franchise had the luxury of having a superstar lead them. Others, like the Atlanta Hawks in the late 2000s and mid-2010s, won their games through grit and weren't carried by elite talent. When thinking of teams that LeBron beasted on, for many, the Hawks aren't the first group that comes to mind. But in reality, they were the quiet victims to the King. In three separate playoff series versus the Hawks, LeBron had a record of 12-0, three sweeps, the most impressive of those being in the 2015 playoffs. Leading up to their eventual conference finals match, the Atlanta Hawks were seen as a true threat to spoiling LeBron and his reunited Cavs. They had won 60 games in the 2014-15 season, earning the number one seed, and were only one out of eight teams in NBA history to have four All-Stars on the same squad. They were stacked, but once they faced the Cavs in the Eastern Conference Finals, they were steamrolled. Without Kevin Love, and with an injured Kyrie Irving who missed two out of the four games, the Cavs swept Atlanta. LeBron averaged a 30-piece, with his most notable performance coming in Game 3. At home, James scored 37 points with 18 rebounds and 13 assists, including two huge clutch shots down the stretch in overtime that led his team to a 3-0 lead. An underappreciated performance by the King, he rose to the occasion when his hobble team needed him to. The Cavs would go on to blow out Atlanta in Game 4 and advance to the Finals. This elimination killed the Hawks' reputation, making their 60-win campaign look like a fluke. It's almost as if that conference finals loss was the end of an era, because the Hawks went from the top of the East to the bottom in just three seasons. Soon enough, this once memorable season faded into irrelevancy. It's easy for fans to write off LeBron's eight straight finals appearances as just a product of a weak Eastern Conference, but he stands alone in the modern era with such an achievement, and none of his superstar contemporaries have ever been able to replicate such success. The Hawks may be a team that's silently owned by LeBron, but a team that everyone knows LeBron owns is the Toronto Raptors. How many players can say they had a nickname created to highlight how much they dominate another team? Not many. But LeBron can. He played them in the playoffs three times from 2016 to 2018, and triumphed in each matchup. In 2016 and 2017, he beat them in six and in a sweep. Not much was thought of from these two victories. The Raptors were just another team in the East Braun beat on his yearly finals trips. In 2018 though, that all changed. A ring in 2019 makes everyone forget. But the fact of the matter is that the 2017-18 season for the Raptors wasn't just any ordinary one. They were the best team the franchise had ever seen, winning 59 games, the most in their 23-year history. Something seemed different about this group. DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry were playing the best ball of their career. They had the coach of the year in Dwayne Casey. They had the best bench in the league. All signs pointed to a deep playoff run with many picking them as the favorites to win the Eastern Conference. The Raptors were the squad that was poised to shove the King off his conference championship throne. Everyone knew that LeBron stood in the way of Toronto, but a sizable majority of NBA fans felt he was beatable. After all, he was without Kyrie Irving who had been traded, and had an incredibly weak supporting cast. This was the Raptors' moment to strike and finally overcome their playoff demons, but instead, they fell into a pit of misery. Not only did the Raptors end their season in the second round, not only did they lose to the Cavs for the third year in a row, not only did they get swept, but they got crushed and humiliated in front of millions, becoming the joke of the NBA. 
We'll be back to Lebronto for the fourth quarter after this. No longer were they called Toronto. Lebronto had become a more fitting mantra. In the Eastern Conference semifinals, Cleveland versus Toronto, James destroyed the Raptors, scoring 34 points per game with 11 dimes and 8 rebounds. In Game 2, he scored 43, including a barrage of mid-range shots executed in such a casual manner you'd think he was at a playground. Game 3 was just as unreal. LeBron hit the game winner to all but end the Raptors' season. Toronto was speechless. All of the hope they had was wiped away in an instant. Game 4 was a blowout. And just like that, yet another number one seed had fallen at the hands of LeBron James. This Raptors series stands out in particular when viewing James' career because of the manner in which it was carried out. This wasn't just any win, it was a crushing victory, a dominant sweep that sent an entire organization into a scrambling panic. Plenty of fans vow to this day that had the Raptors faced off against literally any other team in the East, they would have won. But there was something about LeBron that scared them. Either way, the Raptors management had had enough. They traded DeMar DeRozan in a package that landed them Kawhi Leonard. They fired their head coach, Dwayne Casey, who had just won the Coach of the Year award in favor of Nick Nurse. In an instant, DeRozan's nine-year tenure as the Raptors star, and Casey's seven-year tenure as the Raptors coach had ended. These both ended up being terrific decisions, and Toronto went on to win the 2019 championship. So, if you think about it, they have LeBron to thank for pushing them to make these moves. What a gentleman. Thanks, Bron Bron. There's a reason that this 2018 postseason is considered LeBron's most impressive playoff stretch ever, despite it not resulting in a championship. His biggest accomplishment during this run was easily his Eastern Conference Finals show against the Boston Celtics. Hmm, the Celtics. Wait, these guys seem familiar. When we last left off with the Boston Celtics, LeBron had just defeated them in the 2012 playoffs. It was an incredible series by James, and sent Boston's Big 3 into a retirement home. But the story of LeBron and the Celtics didn't end here. They faced off three more times in the playoffs, all being LeBron wins. Their matchups in 2017 and 2018 are easily the most noteworthy for different reasons. In 2017, the Cavs faced the number one seeded Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. It was utter domination. The entire Cavs team executed their game plan perfectly in what would amount to a 4-1 series victory. Specifically, Game 2 stands out as a microcosm of LeBron's seven-year chokehold on the Eastern Conference. The Cavs treated this important playoff game against their rival like just any ordinary one, blowing them out as their big three combined for 74 points. The Cavs won by 44, and led by as much as 50 points on the road. I know Isaiah Thomas, the Celtics' best player, had an injured hip, but damn, does that really explain a 50-point lead? I don't think so. As we've seen so many times before, losing to LeBron James can often make a franchise's alarm bells go off. The Celtics in 2017 were no different. Ironically enough, after losing 4-1 in disheartening fashion, they traded their star guard Thomas in a package to the Cavs for Kyrie Irving after he had requested a trade. LeBron just witnessed one of the greatest teammates he ever had go behind his back and request a trade. Out of all possible teams, Kyrie was sent to the Celtics, a franchise that had an incredibly heated rivalry with LeBron specifically. This must have been a heartbreaking moment for him. So how did he respond to this emotionally intensive, tragic situation? By beating the Celtics again, of course! Fast forward one year to the 2018 playoffs, and these two teams met once again in the conference finals. While Boston may have been without Kyrie and Gordon Hayward due to injuries, they were still a formidable squad that was fully capable of making it to the finals. The first two games in this series showed exactly that. The Celtics won both in decisive fashion at home. Historically as a franchise, the Celtics were 37-0 and up 2-0 in a series. On top of this, these 2018 Cavs had an infamously bad supporting cast around James. Finally, it seemed like a team in the East had what it took to dethrone the King. Cleveland fought back and won the next two to tie the series, but once the Celtics took Game 5 in convincing fashion, a premature grave was being dug for LeBron and the Cavaliers. If there's anything fans would come to know about LeBron-led teams though, it's that they should never be counted out. 
They won the next two games to clinch a finals appearance, with LeBron going bonkers. In Game 6, he scored 46, with two back-to-back -back clutch threes over Jason Tatum to seal the W. In Game 7, he scored 35, with 15 boards and 9 dimes, including the block of the year on Terry Rozier, and the dagger and one layup with two defenders draped on him. For all the achievements James had in his career, making the finals in 2018 is up there near the top of the list. To make it to the biggest stage against all the odds with little to no help was admirable, and his level of play was legendary. As for the Celtics, they certainly wouldn't blow it up like the 2018 Raptors did, but this loss would haunt them for years, and many in the Boston area consider it a massive missed opportunity. I've talked about a bunch of different playoff series and teams so far, but no video about LeBron James's victims would be complete without mentioning the 2016 Finals. The 2016 Golden State Warriors had the highest regular season win total ever at 73 dubs. This was spearheaded by their unanimous MVP in Steph Curry, along with two other All-Stars in Klay Thompson and Draymond Green. Somehow, James, with his star partner Kyrie Irving, heroically slayed the beast that was the Warriors, overcoming a 3-1 deficit to win the championship. The fashion in which they won will be etched in every Cavs fan's mind forever. LeBron's chase down block on Andre Iguodala in the closeout game 7 is the best defensive play in NBA history, and by far the best moment of James's career. While Bron certainly didn't end the Golden State Warriors dynasty by any means, what he did against them in 2016 will always be his greatest achievement. It forced the Warriors to target Kevin Durant in that summer's free agency which made them a truly unstoppable force that won the next two rings. But the reality is this, LeBron and the Cavs spoiled Golden State's perfect season, and ruined Steph Curry's incredible 2015-16 campaign. That in itself is an owning of epic proportions, and makes the 2016 Warriors one of James's biggest victims. Honorable mention time, Bron Bron has made countless NBA teams his victim, but there are a few players that he's also had great success against. Versus Kemba Walker, LeBron amounted a record of 30-1, yes, 30 wins against Kemba over a 12-year span, and one loss. Against Chris Douglas Roberts, who I've never heard of in my life, James went 14-0. I guess Bron just took matchups against this man personally, I don't know. Jimmy Butler, Joakim Noah, Kyle Lowry, and Paul Pierce were eliminated by LeBron in the playoffs three times. Paul George, four times. Al Horford, five times. The most recent example of a player being flat out punked by LeBron was Dylan Brooks in the 2023 playoffs. The second seeded Grizzlies and seven seeded Lakers played against one another in round one. Memphis guard Dylan Brooks, who is known for his unbashful trash talk, called out James. You and LeBron have that exchange. There are people out there that say, maybe maybe you shouldn't do that with one of the better players in the game. What, I guess, what, what were you thinking? I don't care, he's old. I poke bears. Um, I don't respect no one until they come and give me 40. Man, the ball's on this guy, huh? Absolutely zero people were shocked when LeBron got his lick back, winning the series in six and hitting a plethora of clutch shots while doing so. Typical stuff by this point. LeBron James is a player who, shockingly, I haven't made a single video on to this point in my two and a half year channel history. But I think it's important to take some time to acknowledge his achievements, especially at a time where his career is clearly winding down. LeBron is one of those figures whose accomplishments will only age better with time. The way in which he methodically defeated so many teams and players consistently over the years is unmatched and often overlooked. So while he's still here, don't take him for granted.